Good evening tonight. We want to have a word of prayer before we start. Uh, unmute yourself. There you go. Good evening, and uh, we're going to have a word of prayer before our Pastor Scott teaches the final night of Congress of Christian Education. And uh, we thank each and every one of you for sharing this week and taking time out of your busy schedule to hear what thus says the Lord. And we are truly blessed to be in his word once again. So as we bow our heads in prayer for our final night of Congress of Christian Education, we just thank the Lord for the blessing that he has bestowed upon us. Most graciously, Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for another day, a day that we'll never see again, but we're blessed in it, dear Heavenly Father. We give you all the praise and all the glory, asking that you uh, Watch over Pastor Scott uh, this evening. Be the leading post. Be his guidance, dear Father. Be his teacher tonight as he teaches your word, dear Heavenly Father. Strengthen him and pour the Holy Spirit upon him. We thank you once again for providence, dear Lord, for this Congress of Christian Education. We give all you the glory and give you the praise. And thank you once again for those that are, are listening and going by tonight and understanding your word. Asking that you touch each and every church that you bless and watch over all pastors and all churches dear Father in your name. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. of Christian education, and uh, I don't know, but hopefully maybe we can try this again. Uh, we need to talk and, and uh, figure out maybe if we can do one after the, the holidays somehow in, in January. That would be a, uh, the winter version, I guess. We're, we're adapting uh, as, as uh, the world is changing around us, but um, I pray you have enjoyed these classes. I know I have and have been enriched by hearing God's word, and, and I pray that you have been as well. Uh, we're cer certainly thankful for uh, the opportunity to be able to say anything for the Lord. We're certainly thankful for those who think it not robbery to tune in and listen to what the Lord is saying. We're faithful. Um, and we thank you. We thank you for giving up your time and, and coming on here. And and I, I speak. I think I know I speak for Minister Griffin. We say we certainly miss seeing um, each one of you at the various services. You know, you never know. You never miss the water until the well runs dry, so to speak. Um, and I miss the the uh, uh, institutes, and I miss the convention, and I miss the association this year, but. You know, in this way, it's still a way to to uh, see each other and see your faces. So we just are uh, thankful, and, and we're going to jump right in this evening. My topic that has fallen to me in uh, the book that you have is uh, Day 8. And Day 8 is uh, Faulty Doctrine Can Hurt. Faulty Doctrine Can Hurt. All right. Can you still hear me? Can everybody still hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you still hear me now? All right. So I don't have it on mine. I thought my volume was up. Okay. All righty. So in terms of uh, faulty doctrine, um, one of the things that I have written down on your handout uh, that's in your link uh, when you're ready for it is many false teachers in the world, uh, those who have other doctrines that are anti-Christ, uh, there are many of them. Uh, and this lesson certainly goes along with, with last night's lesson, all religions are not the same. And certainly we need to understand that all Teaching is not the same. 
all teaching is not the same at all. And there is, I don't think there's ever been, of course, I, I haven't lived very long, but just in understanding and hearing other people, I don't think there's ever, thank you, there's ever been a time like now where there is so much faulty teaching, false doctrine. Um, and so there are many false teachers in the world. Uh, the first phrase on your book says people can twist scripture and cause their own uh, destruction. People can twist scripture and cause their own destruction. So as we look at the, what faulty doctrine is, what um, false teaching is, um, basically faulty doctrine is false teaching. Um, faulty doctrine is false teaching. Um, first of all, correct doctrine or, or biblical doctrine is uh, correct biblical teaching. And that word doctrine appears uh, more than 50 times in the Bible. That word doctrine appears more than 50 times in the Bible. Uh, it is, uh, comes from the word in the original language, the Dutch, I think is how it's pr pronounced, the Dutch, uh, possibly. Not great on the, the pronunciations, but basically what that word means is teaching fundamental truth. Um, no matter what religion you are in, each one of them has fundamental truths that is a part of that uh, basic religion. Christianity is the same. And doctrine is one uh, of that, that word simply means basic fundamental truths. We mentioned several last night. Basic fundamental truths. Uh, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus died uh, and his atoning work on Calvary uh, paid for our salvation. Um, his blood is the uh, uh, one thing that as he is the high priest that cleanses sin. All right, so basic fundamental truths. Titus, the first chapter, uh, verse uh, 9 says, as Paul is addressing Titus, this pastoral epistle, it says that we are to hold fast to sound doctrine. He would not have told uh, uh, Titus that. He would not have also said those similar same things to, to Timothy and others had there not been false teaching or faulty doctrine in the vicinity. Um, why do you have to hold to something fast? Because there are things that can come and can, as, as the word says, can sweep you off of your feet, can sweep you Away, So we are to hold firmly, we are to hold uh, strongly, we are to hold fast to sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is the opposite of faulty teaching. Paul also says to Titus in uh, chapter 2 verse 1, he says, But speak those things that which are become of sound doctrine. And that word there means healthy. There's a lot of teaching out there that is not healthy. It is not good. It is not wholesome. It is not healthy to the body. The spiritual believer, obviously, is not healthy to the body of Christ. So we are to teach sound doctrine. Why are we even uh, coming on here tonight and having a Congress of Christian Education? You know, I'm thankful for the ones that are on here. But I also wish there were many more because people need to hear sound teaching. Not because it's me or Minister Griffin. Praise God for, for Pastor Armstrong, Pastor Freeman, and Pastor Jackson, and the other pastors over the years who have taught sound doctrine and good, wholesome, healthy teaching. But there are just as many as there are for those. I'm telling you, there are quite a few more that are teaching faulty doctrine. 
Amen. So Titus tells, uh, or Paul tells Titus, teach sound doctrine. And he also uh, writes to Timothy, why is it necessary? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It is necessary because teaching is necessary. You, you can't learn unless you're taught. You cannot learn unless you're taught. You, then you also have to, there's necessary for reproof to, uh, to work on, to uh, work on those things in a believer, a person that need to be uh, helped, need to be healed, need to be fixed. Uh, correction, he says. And obviously for training, for training in, in, in ways of righteous living. So if you're looking at what faulty doctrine is, let's first look at what correct biblical doctrine is. It is fundamental truth. It is sound teaching. It is uh, something worthy to be held on to. Uh, you know, I, I, as a teacher, a secular teacher, I have found in, in, in the years that I've been teaching that you can work with students on certain things and certain things they will remember forever, and some things they will forget within 30 minutes, of even less than that. And and I don't know about you, but but looking out, if you've ever uh, taught or been over a class, you can look out over a group of people and sometimes see people, they drifting away. Um, you know, so teaching is necessary, but also keep in mind Keep in mind that when you teach, sometimes everybody's not always going to get it. So you got to keep going over those things. I remember the first time uh, Pastor Freeman and at, back at our church where I uh, grew up, I remember him saying, we're going to go back over this one more time. And I think, well, we heard this before, but he said, no, we're going to go back over it. And he would explain why. It was important to go over to make sure everybody forgets it. Let me give you one example. How many of you know somebody, I might open up a can of worms on here, but how many of you know somebody that still believes or still speaks or holds on to the fact that water baptism can save you? I hear it. I hear it often. You ask somebody, here's how you know, have you been saved? And they will say, I was baptized amen so they are equating baptism with salvation uh, and obviously you have to understand that there is more to it than just water baptism that is a teaching that somewhere or a thought process that somewhere has stuck and held on and you have to keep going over that and hammering that uh, nail teach sound doctrine doctrine is necessary Faulty doctrine is teaching um, that word faulty. Um, if you have faulty wiring, it means it does not work correctly. So faulty doctrine is teaching that does not work or that is not reliable. Teaching that does not work or that is not reliable. Ephesians 4.14, if you want to turn there. Ephesians 4.14. It says that when faulty doctrine or teaching um, abounds, that it tosses. Uh, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. If you're, if you're considering what faulty doctrine does, it's been real windy the last several days. And let's put, just pretend that you're a leaf. If, if you are a leaf in this wind, you are blown wherever. You are blown all over the place. You have no control. And there's a lot of teaching out there that blows people all over the place in their thought processes it blows people all over the place from church to church uh, from denomination to nom denomination looking for this looking for that trying to find the next big thing 
Faulty doctrine is not reliable, nor is it healthy, and it does not work. Amen. It tosses people. It tosses various ones about. Faulty doctrine then comes from the twisting or turning of Scripture. There are many who will take a scripture, and we're about to look at that, at that in just a few moments, and they will twist it or turn it to say what they want it to say or to make it sound like something that it is not intended to say. How many of you know the Lord does not condone that practice of taking scripture to twist it and benefit it how you want it to sound? How many of you know that tonight? Say amen. So what is the outcome of twisted scripture? Well, let's go clear to the end of this Bible. And what does God say? What does the Lord himself say concerning his word? He says in terms of twisting scripture and faulty teaching, fake doctrine, he says, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. God is very, very clear with words of warning of adding to scripture twisting scripture, taking things out, putting things in. His word is just so. He wrote it, he sent it, he sealed it, and that's the end of it. And we must hold fast to his word. Sound teaching. Amen. Faulty doctrine leads astray. Uh, let's go on to number two tonight and just consider where did this faulty doctrine uh, begin? Amen. And we all should know this, but in Genesis 2, 17, Satan was the first to twist scripture. So I may be out on a limb tonight and correct me if I'm wrong, but pretty much every twisting of scripture is centered in the fact that the enemy uh, has something different that he wants people to understand about what God's word says. He was the first one to do it. You, for, you are familiar with the story. This is nothing new, but God basically said very in very clear words, uh, not beating around the bush and, and I, no pun intended. Genesis 2, 17, he said, if you touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. That, that's clear to me. So Satan comes right along just a few verses later in Genesis 3, 4 and says, you won't die. You will not surely die. So somebody is lying. <laughs> and how many of you understand on here, praise the Lord, it is not God. God spoke it. He said, you will die if you touch this tree. Satan said he twisted it and said, you won't die. He, he, he places doubt right inside of the garden. So Satan, number one, Jesus called him the father of lies. And how many of you know it doesn't matter where he is. It can be in paradise, that was the Garden of Eden, or it can be in the desert with Jesus. What did he do? He twisted scripture. He twisted scripture. Jesus calls him in John, the 8th chapter, verse 44, he calls him the father of lies. So faulty doctrine, twisting scripture, lying about what God has said is rooted in uh, the plan of the enemy. And the plan of the enemy is to get man to not believe what God says. So if you think about what sin is, sin comes from temptation Temptation comes from desire. Desire is rooted in the, the apparent lack of, of what you think you don't have. And he got Adam to feel like he was lacking something. 
And when Adam got to that point, he got him to not believe God's words. God said you'll die. Satan said you won't die. You don't believe that, do you? Adam said, well, no, I guess I don't. And he touched the fruit. Sin entered in and subsequently so did death. Like God said. Amen. So we need to be in God's word so that we can recognize the lies of the enemy. And there are many lies out there. And not so much more so, I guess, to say that, that God's word, we, we're in the word, but more so God's word is in us. I have heard it said many times, and I love this phrase. It says it's not how many verses that you can handle, but how many verses handle you. Not how many you can quote and, and, and say and speak and and, you know, I'm not always the greatest at quoting scripture verbatim, verse, chapter, and chapter and verse. But uh, we need to understand that we must know scripture and hide it in our hearts. If I may go off on a tangent for just a moment, you never know when it might become illegal one day to have a Bible study. It might be illegal one day to place your Bible on your desk at your place of work to carry your Bible under your arm. So that's why I believe the Lord has already told us you better carry the word of God in your heart. Psalms 119 verse 11. Why is it important, important to, to understand that Satan twists scripture? Because not only does he twist scripture, but he uses those things to fire fiery darts at us in the form of false teaching, false doctrine. If you go to Ephesians 6, 16, this is a very familiar passage of scripture as well. Ephesians 6, 16. And this is when Paul has written and said that we are to stand and we are to put on the full armor of God. And in verse 16, he says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy or of the wicked one. All right. So Ephesians 6, 16, that shield of faith, uh, many times in the military, those shields, uh, especially in some of the ancient militaries, were not just shields that uh, were so big, but they stood from the ground up that you could literally get behind them. How many of you know God's word is a shield that protects us from being persuaded from false teaching? Correct biblical doctrine is the shield that, that strengthens our faith, that protects us, from the fiery darts. Now, as I was looking at that phrase, that phrase grabbed my attention, fiery darts. Those, those are also, if you look at the meaning of that, those are darts that the enemy hurls. Hurls, that means throws with, with force. But also, that, that word also means in a weaker sense that they can be put or placed there. To distract. Amen. How do you know that, that the enemy does not always attack with blunt force trauma? <laughs> Sometimes he just suggests things. He just places things in your mind. He places things in your path to distract you. And I have said this for a long time, and I still agree with it, uh, still say it, his biggest weapon many times is distraction. You can be going along in your Christian walk and focused in and locked in, and he just places something in your spiritual peripheral vision, and he gets you to, to get veer off for just a little bit, just to take a look at it. You know, I, I can't help but be reminded and, and go back to where we just were. You know, Adam and Eve had probably walked through that garden many times. They were naming things. They were doing their job. God gave them a job. But 
one day as they were walking, they looked at that tree one more time and was distracted by the enemy's darts. Sometimes he just places them. That means to, that, that word fiery, dart, that word there means not only to hurl, but to put or to place. That's why it's important to have, as Philippians 2, 5 says, have the mind of Christ so that we can be defended, whether those darts are, are hurled or placed in one's mind. Amen. Questions or comments up to this point? Anybody? Yes? She's got one. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Yes, yes, Sister Scott, that is a wonderful point. And uh, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stand forever. And, and you know, there's only two things, we've heard this before, that, that we can place our hands on tangibly that will last through eternity. And that is the souls of man and God's word. And he meant that when he said his word will stand forever and it will stand unchanged. Amen. That is exactly a great point. Anybody else? Anybody else this evening? All right. Let's, let's move on then uh, to number three. Um, so in terms of faulty doctrine, how, how do we, you know, I said last night, one of the greatest things, wrong things that we can do is be, be silent, uh, not say anything. Um, and I also said that tempered, Excuse me, with the fact that um, how you say something is vitally important too. Um, you know, I, maybe, and I don't know about anybody else, but sometimes all of us can be guilty of coming in guns a-blazing with our heart on fire for the Lord and ramrod. And, you know, how many of you know that, and I know Brother James Williams could certainly attest to this and many others, that everybody you witness to is not the same. Um, you run into different people with different where they are. You, this, this is actually a, a great point. You all remember back uh, uh, when we did, oh my goodness, the uh, uh, explicit gospel or no is the one after that. It was uh, the gospel reset. The gospel reset. Y'all remember that book? And it talked about some people are the Acts 2 group and some are the Acts 17 group. You got people at different places sometimes when you speak to them about the Lord or when you encounter them and every single person is not ready for the guns a-blazing approach sometimes so we have to be tempered uh, with the fact that as we share God's word there are people out there that don't believe like we do or understand like we do but they have different starting points some are that acts too that had a basis had a foundation and maybe have drifted off of it and some are that act 17 that were completely off base they're all over the place and they have a different belief system. So we have to, uh, we don't want to be guilty of not saying anything. And I think we've, we've mentioned that before. Sometimes maybe the church as a whole has been guilty of staying too huddled in these four walls and not being more Matthew 28, 19, and 20 minded. So when we do go out there, realize it's not something new. Jesus did it. Jesus called out false teaching. He called out false teachers. If you are looking at your handout, it says in Matthew 23 verses 1 through 3 that often he dealt with uh, uh, the Pharisees and the Pharisees often were uh, after him. They, 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 you know, there's one passage and it says it over and over and over again. And the Pharisees sought how they might entrap him or, or trick him or trip him up. And he knew that. He already knowing what they were thinking. You've read that in the book several times. So here Jesus is speaking to the multitude, to his disciples, and he's saying the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, 
All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So basically Jesus is saying, they tell you to do something that they themselves are not doing. That is a hypocritical form of teaching. And you know what? That has infiltrated churches all over the place. Do as I say, but not as I do. Live how you want. Do what you want. Listen to my teaching. Obey what God's word says, but I'm not subject to the same things that you are. He called them out multiple times. He called them out. He called them out for commanding and teaching what they were not willing to follow. They had all these laws that they would entrap people in, and he really got their goat when they had the, the poor woman that was caught in adultery, and they showed up, and I saw beautiful at the Holy Land experience a few years ago, a beautiful acting out of that. And at the end of it, all you see is just stones dropping. He called them out when he said, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. He called them out. And they dropped their stones and walked, marched off and walked away. You know what? Guess what? That is what we are to do. We are to be uh, holding fast to sound doctrine so that when the Holy Spirit leads us and the time is right, that we can speak up and speak out against those teachings that are not right. Amen. And I would certainly say that sometimes those teachings that are not right, they can certainly come into the church. They can creep into the church. Peter, like his master, addressed false teaching. This is actually in your book, 2 Peter 3.16. If you have that passage, turn there this evening, 2 Peter 3.16. 3.16 and in that passage it, it basically says um, here that and also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable uh, rest w-r-e-s-t as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Peter is saying, as these people that he is speaking of were listening and looking at the sayings of, of uh, the writings of Paul, his letters, his epistles, which he also was mentioning, he said th those things sometimes may be hard to understand, but there are some who are ignorant, who are unlearned, uh, and they are, are twisting some of the things that are being said um, to their own destruction. So that is perfectly uh, right there front and center that Peter says there are those out there that purposely twist scripture. Twisting scripture brings about your destruction. He says that it was ignorance and instability that will lead to their ruination. If you think about that, the twisting of scripture for those who are listening and trying to understand can create uh, a mindset that is uneven, that's off, uh, that's not right. And what did James, how did James address that? James 1.8 says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So if you've got a lot of different teaching, and you know what, let's, let's go ahead and knock it out of the park tonight. Let's, let's go ahead and say it, let's address it. we got to be careful about listening to everybody that's on TV. We got to be careful about listening to everybody's everybody's sermon and, and what they're saying. And, and there are people that I said, I was listening to this one and I read this one's book and I had this book. I want you to know there are some folks that people had given me their book and I said it politely over in the corner and I said, I'm not going, I'm not going to read that. Amen. Somebody don't, don't be mad at me tonight. Amen. There's some programs that, that I, I used to watch that I don't watch anymore because I heard some things that, that weren't right. Amen? So we got to be mind, mindful. You can't put all kind of, of liquids in the same vessel. Amen? Because it, it, it doesn't work. And it, a double-minded man listening to all these things, having mind all over the place, he is unstable and eventually will topple over. Not only did Peter address false teaching, but Paul addressed it big time. Uh, turn to Acts 20. 
verse 29. Acts 20, verse 29. You have it? Nod your head. Amen. Amen. We got it? And it says, uh, he is speaking to those as he is about ready to depart. This is after one of my favorite verses. Uh, let's back up to 28. And it says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Minister Griffin read this the other night too. Feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Then he says, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. All right, so what is, what is he meaning there? What is he saying? He's saying that that, that false teachers, false teachings, um, wrong interpretations of, of Scripture, uh, wrong viewpoints of God's Word, people who will be carrying that, they will try to come in. Paul addressed this with this group of people. He addressed this uh, with the young pastors, amen, of which I am one. He, he encouraged them to recognize false teaching. Romans 16, verses 17 through 20. Turn there. Romans 16, verses 17 through 20. Amen. Romans 16, verse 17 through 20. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. And then he turns around and says, not only mark them, but then he says, avoid them. Amen. So we're not only to, as Paul said in Acts 20, 29, to recognize them, but we are to mark them and then avoid them. And then he talk, tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 5. 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 5. He says that we are to withdraw from them. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stop right there. Let's just pause for a minute. If it's not Jesus' words, do we need it? <laughs> do we need to be fooling around with it and, 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 and worrying about it and, and, and having classes about it? If it's not centered in Jesus Christ, leave it alone. Mark them, avoid them, get rid of it. Amen. Lord, somebody, go up into your, your library tonight and make sure every book on there is right. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We don't need man's word. We need a word from the Lord. Amen. Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and stripes of words. How many of you have heard Paul say that often? Avoid those who are worried about vain babblings and genealogies and all that type of stuff. And people raising questions that confuse people. He's saying avoid those things. Where of come envies and strife and railings and evil surmisings. He's saying from false teaching these things arise. The devil is the author of confusion. You show me a confused church, I'll show you a confused teacher behind it who is trying to stir up and kick up things and has misinterpreted or, or given a viewpoint that is not according to scripture. He says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness, uh-oh, from such withdrawal yourself. I, I, I'll go ahead and pull the cover off this one, and I know it's already been pulled off, but this prosperity preaching is eating our folks alive. It is eating people alive. It is tearing people up. People are, especially in hard economic times, people are looking for a word, and somebody tells them, if you send me X amount of dollars, I'll give you a word. How many of you know that the prophet, one of the minor prophets, I believe it was Amos or Nahum said that this prophet that only has a word when there's money, kick him to the curb. Amen. 
the one that gives you a word even when there's no money involved and tells you what thus saith the Lord, you need to keep that person around. Amen. The Lord is really speaking explicitly today. And he, this, you know, I saw somebody say this the other day. A lot of preachers have been tested during this time when there's no big crowds to preach to and no hoopla and no organs behind them and, and, and no big crowds running and, and a lot of dr dramatic going. And maybe all you got is what we got here tonight, a computer screen. Are you still willing to preach? Are you still willing to, to talk to two people? Are you still willing to call the folks on the phone and give them the word over the phone? A lot of preachers, their metal is being tested as were they in for it, in this for the money, in for it for the notoriety, into it for the gainsaying, are they into it because Jesus called them and they have a mandate to preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. What's in you will come out. Amen. So, he is saying, mark them, avoid them, withdraw from them. He is saying, be mindful that false teaching abounds. Well, false teaching abounds, and this is what really the crux of, the, of day eight was, and I didn't want to deal solely just with that, so I uh, cushioned this with some false teaching uh, from what the, the Bible says. But here it is. We are to contend for the faith. So one of the false teachings that is mentioned here is one that has to do with blood. Now, we have been trying to get through the book of Leviticus here at our church, and I'll tell you what, Leviticus is a bloody book, and it is a repetitious book when you start considering all the offerings that, that are mentioned, but every single part of Leviticus points towards Christ's atoning work. He being the high priest, and, and the high priest of that time, uh, uh, carrying out the duties of the high priest and so then therefore we see uh, when we see this we see Jesus Christ in the book of Leviticus but Jehovah witnesses have misinterpreted a scripture coming from Leviticus 726 and 727 and then also repeated again in seven, uh, chapter 17 of Leviticus verses 11 and 12 that where it says the in the in the um, in the flesh in the blood there is life and you are to not take any blood in because blood obviously in the book of Leviticus represents the atoning work that Christ would come and perform he would be the last and final sacrifice but Jehovah Witnesses have come and have said that uh, that what is happening is they, when you take blood in, that is against their belief. And so as you, if you read your book, you have to understand this, that many have died because they refuse to take blood transfusions because of what they think Leviticus 7 and Leviticus 17 says. Isn't that sad? Now, that is all premised, once again, that let's just be honest, Jehovah's Witness is a call. It's a call. Amen. Uh, Y'all remember back in 1997, that group of people that had, uh, had their suitcases packed and were setting up with suitcases packed and the, the comment, hail bop comment, uh, was coming through our vicinity and in, in, in our solar system and they had that ready and had their suitcases packed and had poison and I think plastic bags to put over their heads, and they took all that with hopes and the idea as they had been taught, uh, taught to that the rapture was imminent when this comet went by, they would catch the tail of the comet and would go to uh, the place that they thought they were going to. That was a false teaching. 39 people lost their lives. I mentioned last night or the night before, uh, Jim Jones down there in South South America all those people a lot of people from uh, people of color from churches uh, in big cities I do believe that was maybe San Francisco followed after him on the whim of false teaching and children women men uh, uh, women adults lost their lives because of false teaching okay 
And we could think of many, many more. I'm sure all of you could think of some on here tonight where they have twisted scripture or scripture has been twisted and people agreed with it, went along with it, and it cost them their lives. Uh, that is, that's sad and it's scary and it's, it, it should also be a mandate to us to be reminded that our job is not done in sharing the true word of God. Amen. The last thing I want to cover tonight, number five, is simply this, that we need to imitate the Bereans. Amen. Turn to Acts, back to Acts, the 17th chapter, verses, uh, or just verse 11. We'll just do verse 11. Acts, the 17th chapter, verse 11. Um. Paul had been to Thessalonica, uh, was headed to Athens. He was in going to Berea, and it, he was sent away in Silas uh, by night unto Berea. He got run out of town. Amen. Uh, and he says when they were coming there, verse 11 says, and it says these men or these ones were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. I, as I've watched that verse and looked at that verse, I cannot also be, help but be reminded uh, hearing Sister uh, Carolyn Freeman in many of her testimonies back at Tribestone for years talking about searching the scriptures for yourself. The word Berea literally means uh, heavy or weighty, all right? Uh, that's where the word it comes from, heavy or weighty. We are to test and study and open and search the scriptures for the weighty things of God. To literally, have you ever been there? You read God's word and his glory, his weightiness comes in to the atmosphere where you are, the vicinity where you are, God's word becomes real right there as you read and open him up. We are to search the scriptures daily for the weighty things of God. Search the scriptures. How do you become a better Bible study and able to, a student and able to contend for the faith? By searching the scriptures, by studying the scriptures. The, 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 the word of God says these men were... These ones were more noble. And noble means that they were focused on having the highest possible character. You can only have the highest possible character and only be what God wants you to be through his word. People are telling you in these books, Lord have mercy, have your best life now. I want you to know you can't read some man's book and have your best life. But you can read the Lord's book and live the very best and reach the potential he wants you to reach by studying his word and living his word. Amen. Uh, I can also still hear in Bible study being taught and told that we must pick. And he would just roll these words over and over and over again. Pick and peck and scratch and poke. And dig and pick and peck God's word daily for little nuggets that sustain us. I can't speak for you tonight, but I'm at a point now, and not only with the pandemic, but with life just in general, that I need a word daily to sustain me. I need God's word to sustain me. And just one word, just something that, that I can read that encourages me. And even now more so than ever, we have phones that a scripture can pop up all throughout the day. You can get it on Twitter. You can get it on Facebook. You can get it on Snapchat. You can, it can pop up. And so we have all these means and tools to have God's word in front of us. But if nothing is like you and the Lord sitting down and just saying, God, just feed me just one thing for today. Amen. Sound doctrine. Sound hermeneutics is the word that is mentioned correct interpretation of biblical text. Now, I did not put this next statement on there, 
to be funny whatsoever, but you may think it's funny, but it also is serious. And that statement says, I used to listen to Joel Osteen. Amen. I used to. Come on, saints. Amen. I would, and I would listen to him. I think he was on maybe the BET channel for that matter. It was part of my Sunday ritual to get up and turn on my gospel music. Amen, somebody. And, and to uh, listen to him. And then G.E. Patterson would come on. Well, I kept listening to G.E., but I turned Joel off. Stop recording him. Stop putting him on the DVR. Here's why. Because there were some things that he started to say and had, had been saying that after I got to thinking about it and listening to what the Lord was telling me did not match up with Scripture. So we, uh, we everybody in here, we need to understand there better be some used to's in your life. Amen. There better be some used to's in your life. I used to. Listen to him, listen to that, and we need to right now listen to Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 17 says, preaching based on the Bible, not on man's thinking. How can they hear without a preacher? We must preach. Preachers on here. We got several preachers on here tonight. We must preach not based on our thinking or on man's thinking, but based on this sacred text. Amen. Based on God's word. And I want you to know that God's words today are not popular words. So therefore, if God's words are not popular, your preaching will not be popular. Your teaching, your stand will not be popular. Uh, the last thing that I want to look at quickly is this, uh, that scripture. And we did a little bit of this here one time. When you study scripture, make sure to be able to understand that faulty teaching takes a lot of different angles. Scripture can be studied historically. It can be studied. Some of the passages change based on the geographic location. Scripture can also uh, be studied and looked at grammatically. Uh, grammatically, one little, as Sister Scott said earlier, one little mark, one little change can change the whole meaning of the text. One word can change the whole meaning of the text. And there are several other ways that, that you can look at scripture. Um, some of these twisted scriptures, and, and I'll go through these quickly, and it's on your handout, and then we'll be, be finished. Um, some people say, love your neighbor as yourself. And then somebody twists that and says, you can't love your neighbor until you love yourself. <laughs> How about that one? Lord have mercy. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your neighbor until you love yourself. So what is that really saying? Take care of yourself. Can you see how that can be turned into all kind of messed up sermon? Amen. Messed up Sunday school. Messed up men's group. Lord, okay. <laughs> Amen. The objection to that particular teaching would be Matthew 16, 24, that says, Jesus said, if any man will come after me, first let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Uh, here's another one. Philippians 4, 8. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest. And then it goes on to say, whatsoever things are a good report. Think on these things. Somebody will twist that and say, you, you need to think about yourself. Think you think on these things. Think about you and you can become a better person. How do you know without the scripture we can't become better people? We cannot become better people. Uh, another one that actually I may touch on Sunday. Habakkuk uh, uh, 1 5. Uh, 1 5 says, I am doing a new thing that you wouldn't even believe if I told you. Some people shout all over that verse. I'm doing a new thing and you won't even believe it until God shows it to you. That's taken out of context. If you read the next verse, the Lord tells uh, Habakkuk uh, that what's going to happen is I'm bringing in a nation that's going to destroy, going to tear you all up. The Chaldeans are coming to town. So you connect that. If That's the problem with taking one verse and out of context instead of looking at it within the whole passage. Here's another one. I know I'll get in trouble with this one, and that's all right because this is the last night. So here we go. Philippians 4.13. 
That verse does not mean you can do anything that you set your mind to. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means whatever condition you're in, Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was snake bitten. Paul was beaten, left for dead, thrown in prison. He was abused, accused. He's saying whatever state I'm in through Jesus Christ, I'm still more than a conqueror. Not that whatever comes in my life, I can do anything. I can achieve it. We got athletes wearing bands and people are looking in that from that, that, that verse through a wrong concept sometimes. That is saying even in death, I can still be successful. Amen. It doesn't mean you're successful against everything that you want to do, but it means that whatever comes your way through Christ, you can be strengthened and you can succeed. Uh, there are many other examples of twisted scripture. I don't know how much percentage we have, brother. Five, we're good. Any questions or comments as we close this out tonight? We're running on limited power back here. Amen. But the Lord is keeping us. I want to real quick tell you how good God is. The other night, the, the iPad that's controlling this whole thing, he said amen on the prayer, and it was at 1% and cut off. So God is good. We got 5% tonight. Amen. So any questions or comments? Anybody? Twisted scripture is faulty. Anybody? Speak up. Come on. Come on. Anybody? Thank you. God. We, we enjoy it. Amen. 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 Yeah, yeah. Amen. Yes, he will. <laughs> Amen. Moderator, you have something, brother? Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you, brother. God bless you. It, as you all were speaking, another one came to mind. Uh, one that is misinterpreted, Lord help me, it's either Matthew 16, 18 or Matthew 18, 16, where it says, if you bind it in heaven, on earth it shall be bound in heaven. If you loose it on earth, it shall be loose in heaven. A lot of people take that to mean we can take God and make him do what we want. But in reality, what that verse says is what's already been decided in heaven lines up with what we uh, pray on earth and how we should pray. We can't make heaven do anything. Heaven's already got its plan and it's carrying it out and we need to come into line with what's been decided in heaven. You know what? I, I, <laughs> I'm guilty. We sang that song. If you bind it on heaven or in heaven, if bind it on earth, it should be bound in heaven. And we will tear that song up. And I got to think one day, I'm singing false teaching. Amen. Amen. And we have to be careful. Even sometimes it's in the songs that sound good and we like. But we need to think about what it's saying before we uh, stand up to sing it. Amen. Uh, anybody else? All right. Amen. Okay. Thank you. God bless you all. We're hoping uh, January to try uh, uh, sometime to do our third quarter, okay? All right. Uh, close out with prayer this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your teaching, dear Lord, as we lift the pastor Scott up there. And Father, we just thank you mightily, give you all the praise and all the glory. And thank you for this week, dear Heavenly Father, that the ones that have listened and learned and burning in the heart that they can take it to a sin sick world and tell others about their goodness. 
asking that you touch each church in Providence, dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, that you strengthen them, dear Heavenly Father, through this COVID season. Those that are sick and afflicted, dear Lord, mm -hmm. watch over them, be a healer to them, dear Lord. Yes, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, the lost, that uh, we can get your word, dear Heavenly Father, and right to the word meets them at, dear Heavenly mm -hmm. Father. We thank you for your many, many blessings. I ask you right now that you dismiss us, dear Lord, and that we come with a ready mind for our next session in January, dear Heavenly Father, that those that are not uh, here this week, that they will come in January, dear Lord, and more and more learn about you. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. For we love you and we thank you for your, your word. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 Happy Thanksgiving early to everybody and God bless you all and we love you and, and uh, have a great weekend, all right?